Well, good morning and welcome once again to the Grace Community Church virtual service. We're so glad that you've tuned in to watch us this morning. And, you know, it would be great if you would raise your voices and sing it out and let all your neighbors hear that you're praising God. So thank you again and praise God. Heavenly Father, the only way for your voice to be louder than everything else around us, I think, Father, we have to get small and quiet. I think that's why in the Bible so many times it says to go to your secret place. I think that's why so many times Jesus went out beyond the city limits by himself to talk to you. Father, even in, in my own head personally, it's so loud and busy. Father, your voice is all that matters. It's the thing that gives us inspiration to write songs. It's the thing that gives us motivation to wake up in the morning. It's the thing that gives us safety to know that we can sleep at night, that you've got everything under control. Thank you, Father, for everything that you do, all that you do that we're not even aware of to make this path for us, to make a way. We praise you with all that we are. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 
Redeemer. the sun where to stand in the morning and who told the ocean you can only come this far and who showed the moon where to hide till evening who words alone can catch a falling star Today's offering also includes, uh, the first Sunday of every month, a special offering for what we at Grace Church call the Benevolence Fund. Uh, we kind of approach Benevolence Fund as a, an extra above and beyond offering given by free will from the people of God. So on top of what you regularly give to support the church, if you regularly give and if you haven't gotten into that habit, it's a really good practice to understand uh, we're not under the obligation of the law. Uh, we aren't required by the law of the Moses to give this or that. We're actually in the new covenant, and in the new covenant, everything that we have is his. And we're to always be ready to lay it at his disposal. So um, you can give your regular um, support, and if you care to help us to help the poor, that's what we use benevolence for. Somebody wrote to us recently, uh, one of our members who was in great need um, because she has cancer and she ended up having some unexpected bills through this treatment because she fell in between uh, Medicare and retirement. She's getting Social Security, but Medicare had not yet kicked in, so she's having to apply to some uh, uh, benevolence from the hospital. But uh, we're going to share with her, if we can, some of her need. So... Um, that's what we do with it. And if you need an accounting of it, uh, Dory or our treasurer can send to you. This is what we've done with benevolence. We helped this guy pay his rent. We helped this gal with her gas bill. We helped this person with food. Or we helped this person spend the night in a motel. That just reminds me, I helped somebody, a whole family spend the night in a motel, and I didn't even turn in the receipt. So uh, sometimes that happens because people come to churches all the time asking for help. So on top of what you give, benevolence is also used to help people in need. And um, we use all of the money just for that, okay? We don't ever zero it out, but we use it to help people as need comes up. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for those who share with Grace Community Church in its endeavors to minister to people. Um, we pray that you'll find us faithful in our management of all resource that is shared with us, whether it is money or whether it is 
stuff or whether it is people who they're the most important resource of all, Lord, people. They are so valuable that you give your life for them, as we have just seen. We thank you for it. We pray that you'll help us to remember that the greatest resource of all is not money. It is souls, men and women and children who need to know you. And that's why we're doing this thing called church. In Jesus' name, amen. Save your king. If you're a believer born again and you know the Lord God, 
and you believe in Jesus Christ as a Savior, it does identify you with Israel. Whether you like it or not, it does identify you with Israel. So in the news, you might hear certain individuals in the Middle East, so-called leaders who say, uh, Israel is, is little Satan and America is big Satan. So just know that that's a reality. I mean, we're living in a world that's uh, got a lot of people that don't like what you stand for, or what Israel stands for, or what freedom is. And uh, there's a lot of religions in the world that are anti-Christian, and they would do everything they could to attack Christendom. Many believers in many places in the world have had to hide, and they're openly persecuted. Would that come to America? We never thought it would, but it, apparently it's right on our doorstep. So let me read you out of Revelation chapter 12. The dragon saw he had been hurled to the earth. The dragon is Satan. He pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. That's metaphorical picture of Israel who brought, who God used to bring to the world Jesus Christ. The woman, Israel, was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her where she would be taken care of for a time, times a half a time. Out of the serpent's reach, from the mouth of the serpent, that is from what this particular enemy, Satan, does, he spewed out water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with a torrent that came out of his mouth. So what is this? You have to know the rest of the scriptures because when Jesus talks about Satan, he says he is the father of lies. So what does he do? He issued forth anti-Semitism, and it pursued Israel through time and through history, and it's an anti-God, anti-Semitic, that is anti-Jewish, propaganda to kind of cause people to think that the Jewish people ought to be eradicated. And that's one of the reasons that so-called Hamas uh, attack Jewish people just because they're Jewish. In the, usually the Fenes, that's uh, Claude Fenet, he's 90 some years old. He, he, he didn't come today, but he had to flee and get hidden in France. He was only, I think he was like six or something like that. Uh, when the Nazis came and took his mother, his grandma, his grandpa, a couple of his cousins and other family members on a train to Auschwitz where they were burned to death. And so now he's living again. Uh, we're now just because he's a Jewish person, they want him dead. Say, well, what about the, what about the Palestinians? Well, yes, there's going to be a lot of problems with this, but, uh, just know that this is all biblical and this was prophesied by Jesus Christ that was going to happen. So he spewed out a torrent against her, but the earth helped her by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon spewed out of his mouth. What happened there? Historically, since the founding of Christendom, uh, Jewish people fled into non-Jewish lands like Spain, Europe, France, Russia, all over the place. And there they found kind of like a protection for a while because Christendom understands that what Jesus said when he told the Samaritan woman, which is, by the way, where so-called Palestine is at, he told her that salvation is of the Jews. Jesus, remember, is a Jew. He is a Jew. Then the dragon, this is Satan, was enraged at the woman. So it's an unprovoked, insane hatred of the people of Israel just because they're Jewish. That's the only reason. There is no reasoning behind it. It's just because they're Jewish. He was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Who are they? Those who keep God's commands and hold fast to the testimony about Jesus Christ. So the war, it does involve you. Whether you like it or not, it does involve you. So our own Homeland Security just yesterday issued a warning nationwide to all Americans to be on the lookout for what they call lone wolves because there are people who have been so-called radicalized and uh, they do think and take seriously the notion of attacking you just because you're Christian because you're part of the great Satan. So that's why we have a security team, and we need more individuals, men and women, to volunteer for that. We have a retired state police officer out front right now and a couple of other men to help. Just we need to understand that we live in those times. That's why you lock your door at night and lock your car, because there's drug addicts and there's thievery and there's those kinds of things are the realities of the world we live in. But the Lord isn't asking us to live in fear. He's asking us to live in trust. 
say, but what about when stuff happens that shouldn't happen, like Auschwitz or uh, Hamas uh, invading an innocent gathering of people and killing a bunch of them and taking them captive, or in the case of Rose, where some madman came in and took her daughter's life. So what do you do with these things? All I can say is this, evil is in the world, and it is not from God, and it is not God's fault. Evil is in the world, and evil is always active. But there is God, and there is the Holy Spirit, and there is the presence of God, and there are the promises of God, and they will help you as a believer. And this message is, it originates from this. Thursday, I had to go with Rose and her family to see Brandy's remains, and that was a very difficult time. So I spent the whole week before we went thinking about, how do I talk to them? What do I say? You know, because isn't God supposed to protect us from these things? Aren't we supposed to be believers, and shouldn't this stuff not happen to us? But the fact of the matter is it did happen. And the first thing I told Rose and the family was, I have no answers. There are no answers when something tragic or horrible happens in life. There's just this. You can trust in God. You can trust in His promises, and you can know that He will make all things work out for the good. So I start with that. I didn't even put the reference here. We know that God worketh all things for good for those who love Him. That's I didn't put the reference there because you already know it, right? It's Romans 8.28. God works all things for the good. Now, all things means the good and the not good the difficult things, the things that are like, God, why are you letting this in my life? I just got over that. Now you're letting this in my life. What are you doing, God? I, I, I don't know when it was, but in my life, I'm 64 years old now. I decided at some point, I'm not going to question him. I'm not going to challenge him because I don't think that God is to blame for evil. I don't like some of the things that I've had to face as a believer, as a human being on earth. Some of the things that I've dealt with in life, it's like, I'd rather not choose. I think if God let you choose, you would say no to most of the stuff you've gone through. But that's not our uh, oversight. It's God's. Why does he allow us to go through these things? Because there is an end plan. God says this about his self. I am the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega the everlasting, the almighty, the ancient of days. So when he says beginning and end, and in the Bible, alpha and omega, beginning and end, he's already at the end of it all. We're not. He's there already because he's not limited to time like you and I are. So he already sees you and I. So Paul is able to write this, that when he returns, we return with him. He already sees you in the glorified state. He already sees the end result of you being a Christian. Right now, you are in linear time, so you don't see the end result, but he does. And his sight isn't just for this lifetime or the next one or your kids or grandkids. His sight goes for thousands of generations into the future. His sight, his foresight as God goes into eternity itself. So all of that to say that There's difficult things that happen in this world and in this life, many inexplicable things that philosophers and theologians have tried to answer. I'm not going to answer them because I don't think I can. But I can say this, God is really there. And God really can work all things out for the good. So I do think we need to look for that. Okay, God, what is the good in this? What are you going to make good out of this? Like when Jesus died on the cross and the disciples who had given up everything to follow him, they had given up their careers, their homes. Many times the family members started to reject them because they were following this prophet. And um, they saw him dead on the cross. They saw the Romans arrest him, have him beaten and killed and hanging on a cross dead. The man who did miracles and drove out demons and walked on water, they saw this. They saw him dead. So it was the ultimate disappointment. You had given your life to follow this individual, and all of a sudden it seems like if it was all over. What was it? We know that God, we know the rest of the story because God took the death of Christ and he gave to us the greatest hope of all mankind, resurrection. What's resurrection? That the dead can rise again. The dead can be made alive again. That when you see someone who is dead, their body is dead, but they themselves, if they believe in him, the Bible says, he slash she who believes in me, even if he dies, he shall live So those who have loved the Lord and believed in Him and had faith in Him, they're actually not dead. 
They're alive. The body of Christ is not just the people at church or the people in all the churches all over the nation or all over the world. The body of Christ is every true believer who has ever believed. Read Hebrews 12. You have come to Mount Zion. Millions and millions of elect angels and all of the elect of all time, men and women who have ever had faith in God. That's the body of Christ. And so, Brandy, she's not here in this world anymore, but she is in the world that we will all go to. She is in the spirit realm where the Lord God is. One day he will resurrect her body and give her a body that will never die again and never be subject to dying again or being killed or or her life being removed illegally from her. So I'm going to try to speak to this. And Rose told me yesterday she was coming to church and I'm very aware of that. So I think her her trial and her family's trial is ours as well. And it might help you too as you listen into this sermon. Because when you think about life and facing the challenges of life, what's the difference between a believer and somebody who is not a believer? What is the difference anyway? Well, you believe, but that's good for you. But I just do my own thing. The difference between a believer and a non-believer is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, unfortunately, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the teaching of who He is and what He does, has been hijacked by modern feeling-oriented theology. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. You can't feel the Spirit. You don't feel with physical senses the Spirit of God. By nature, when you study, when I was in theology school, and by the way, just because I went to theology school doesn't make me better than you. It's just that I've studied this. I've devoted my life to studying all of this since I became a born-again Christian. I started going to Bible churches, then I went to Bible Institute, then I went to Bible college, and I went to seminary because it just drew me. I wanted to know. I wanted to understand. The Holy Spirit is in theology called pneumatology. And that word pneumos is the word in Greek. And you get the word in English, pneumatic. You ever gone to have your tire changed and they pull out this and they put your tire on? That's a pneumatic tool. And it puts your the lugs on your tire, the nuts on the lugs of your tire with force through pneumatics. But that's air. You can actually feel physical air and you can actually subject air. You can take it, compress it and analyze it in a microscope and figure out what it is. But when we say pneumos here, spirit of God, we're talking about that which is unseen. You can't put this into a microscope or a lab environment. You can't study him by physical means. You must understand who he is by the teaching of the Lord. And none other than Jesus Christ teaches about the Holy Spirit, and he's who we should go to first. Yes, the Apostle Paul taught about the Holy Spirit to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 13 and in Ephesians. But Jesus Christ first teaches about the Holy Spirit extensively to the disciples right before he dies, because the next phase of God's plan on earth would be to give the Holy Spirit to the people who believe. So let's look at this. The Holy Spirit is active throughout the world. What is the Holy Spirit doing? Is the Holy Spirit just for believers? No, actually, the Holy Spirit is always moving throughout the whole world. Because if you understand the teaching of the Bible, even at creation, it says, in the beginning was God, and the Spirit of God hovered over the deep. God has always been in concert. And then God spoke. There's the Word of God. There's the Holy Trinity there. So the Holy Spirit is always active, and God never acts in disunity is in concert. The Spirit, the Father, and the Son act in concert. God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son at the baptism of Jesus Christ. This is my Son whom I love. Listen to Him. And the Spirit came upon Him in the form of a dove, and Jesus Christ presented Himself to humanity right there. So God is in three persons, and the person of the Holy Spirit is active all the time throughout the world. Before Jesus came, gave His life, and died on the cross, before that happened, The Holy Spirit could not come into a human being who believed in God and stay there because their sin had not yet been paid for. So after Jesus dies, something changes. I'll try to show this to you. So the Holy Spirit is active. Look what he does. Jesus speaking here. Judas is already gone. He has allowed evil to come into him. The Bible says Satan entered into him at the Last Supper. He went out and it was night. And what he went out to do, he had already taken money, was to go find soldiers and and the people he had gotten money from to come and arrest Jesus Christ and put him on trial. 
So Judas had already succumbed to evil. So evil is there, and it was right in the discipleship group of Jesus Christ himself, and Jesus knew it. When in John 6, 6, 6, when most of the disciples abandoned Jesus Christ, he turns to the 12 and he says, do you want to go to? And Peter stands up, who do we go to? You're the one that has the words of eternal life. Have I not chosen you, the 12? But one of you is still a devil. One of you has not really turned your life over. It was Judas. There was still even in the discipleship group of Jesus Christ himself, probably for our benefit, to understand that even in our associations, somebody may not believe in the Lord. Somebody in your own family and in your own association may not truly believe. Someone shared that with me last night, called me up to say, my wife abandoned me and left me. And, you know, my kid, her, the kids, you know, they, they told me that Jesus is just a man in a book. And I go, wow, you know, even your own kids might deny Jesus Christ, but you have to make up your mind. Are you faithful to him no matter what and no matter who turns away? Are you going to stay with him all the way through or not? And I have learned this over time as a, a Christian minister and as a Christian. I have never seen a truly born-again person ever turn away from Jesus Christ and God, ever. I've never seen it. I've seen people turn away. And yeah, I've seen Christians get discouraged and say, I'm not going anymore. I don't believe anymore. And later on, they're sorry and they come back. That's different. But I've never seen a true Christian be able to say, I don't believe in him. I reject him. I don't want the Bible. I don't want God anymore. That means they never knew him if they can do that. If they can do that, they didn't know who he was. Judas did it because he really didn't know who Jesus really was. So Jesus teaches here, when he, he, the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me, that's atheism. And in regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because Satan, the prince of this world, now stands condemned. Okay, so this is one of the, part of the answer concerning what happened with Rose and her family. What's God going to do then? What's, what does it say? Casey told me this one, and so did Adam, who is the widower of Brandy. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Let's pretend for a minute that you could repay someone who did wrong to you. You could repay. That you could actually get the vengeance that you think you ought to have. I'm, I'm not saying this because of Rose. So any of us. Would it satiate you? Would it satisfy you? Would you actually feel better for it? Would it bring your loved one back? Obviously, we need to let this reside in the hands of God because he's the only one that can actually make good come out of this. He's the only one. So we may as well just say, okay, Lord, I pray that the right outcome would occur. And even if it doesn't in this world, I know that you will judge it rightly at the end of time. He will judge Satan. He will separate Satan from us forever, Revelation says. He'll be cast into the lake of fire. He will completely eradicate evil completely. He will do this. We know this because the Bible promises it. Say, well, that's good for them, but what about now? Wait. We, we must wait. We must have patience how God works things out, how God does things in time and in history. And if you learn the patience of God, you will have the peace of God. Now, the difference for a believer and a non-believer is simple. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to them, in them, and for them. The Holy Spirit is in the Christian. The Holy Spirit's work is what gives you the strength. People th ask questions like, how do you go through it? Well, I don't. God goes through it with me. What did David say? He learned this long before Jesus even came. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. When you're a believer, you understand that God is with you when you go through things. He really is with you, and you don't have the strength, but He does. He knows how to take you through anything and everything. So He says, I tell you the truth, this is Jesus. He, he emphasizes this. I am the Savior. I am the one that came into this world to save the world. And I'm not lying to you. There's information and misinformation in this world. There's all kinds of news and fake news. Indeed, when you read what Jesus said about Satan, he said that he is the father of lies. And he is a murderer from the beginning. And when he speaks 
lies, he speaks his native language. So misinformation started with Lucifer since before the creation of the physical world. Because when we see him first in Genesis in the Garden of Eden, he's already Satan. So that means he's already turned away from the truth of God. He's already spinning yarns and misinformation about God since before creation. And so when you listen to Satan and his misinformation, you'll actually listen to lies. So lots of people are being influenced by what's happening globally and listening to misinformation instead of listening to truth. I listened to a ambassador out of Palestine speaking on the news, and he said, oh, everything that happened, it's all Jewish propaganda. In other words, the butchering of children and babies and the beheading of individuals and the taking captive of over 1,500 Jewish people just because they're Jewish uh, is just propaganda so that they can do what they're doing. Propaganda? Was 911 propaganda? Was World War I and Two propaganda? Is all of this just propaganda? You have to listen to information and the truth of God is what you need to listen to. How do you listen to truth? By listening to the Word of God. Without the Word of God, you won't have a basis in truth. We're in a Bible church. This church believes in the authority of the Bible, the Word of God. We don't believe in our own authority. We believe in God's authority. And the authority of God is based in the Bible. Say, yeah, but how do you know what's the Bible? Well, we know the Bible by what God has revealed to us. I, Jesus, tell you truth. It is. Remember what Pilate said when Jesus was in front of him? What is truth? I'm cynical. Everybody says they know everything. And he, Jesus told him, everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. Jesus said this. Those who don't want to listen to God, to Jesus, to the Bible, they don't listen to God. They're atheists, they're agnostics, they're deniers of God and the Bible. So you need to make your own mind up about what you listen to or even what you let your kids listen to. Are you going to let your kids be discipled by an educational system that says there's no God, there's no Bible, there's no Jesus Christ, that all religions are the same and you shouldn't push your faith on them? They're your kids. You say you love your kids. Do you care about their eternal souls? Their eternal souls hang in the balance based on what this book says, not based upon Freudian philosophy or atheistic agnostic teaching that's out there in this world. That's why you need to take control of the discipleship of your own family, your own self, your own thinking, your own mind. I tell you the truth. It is for your good I'm going away. Well, Jesus was here. He was limited. Why? Because the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. When He became human, He came into a human body. And by being in a human body limited Him to being in one place at one time. So He says, I must go away. Because unless I go away, the Counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him to you. This is the genius of Christianity. Yes, Jesus could have stayed here. He could have made a church in Jerusalem. We could all listen to Him on Zoom or something. But he's done it differently. He's done it differently. The way it works is this. The Holy Spirit comes and he is our source of counsel and truth. The Holy Spirit is our source of information and truth. You need to make this decision now as a Christian because of all that we are in with social media. There's so much information. You turn this a news story, that news story, and so-and-so says this, and so-and-so says that, that you get confused. Even in church, this preacher says that, and that church says this, and everybody says that they're the only ones that know. But here's the genius of Christianity. The Lord isn't going to leave you in a state of confusion. He's going to give you the tools and the ability to understand what is truth. Now, in the case of the man that called me last night and said, my wife left me and I came home and everything was gone and she took the kids with her. He said to me that she had been listening to a counselor and this counselor was not a believer. A non-believing counselor, do you think a non-believing counselor will tell you to follow Jesus? Do you think a non-believing counselor will tell you to stay in your marriage? Do you think a non-believing counselor will tell you to stay in a Bible church? They'll actually tell you the opposite. They'll tell you, you need to get away from that. That's a cult. You need to listen to, you need to have a world perspective. You need to get away from that. Those people are, are too radical. 
The non-Christian counseling is very dangerous. Yes, counseling is good if the counseling is from the Lord. That's why the God of the Bible says that he has given to the church, apostles, prophets, teachers. Why? You can come to them. You can speak to your pastor. I have a lot of information that I could share with you. I know how to show you in the Bible what it says about marriage, about finance, about depression, about drugs, about alcohol, about sex, about health, about life, about eternal life. I can show you in the Bible. And so can many Christians around you. But if you'd rather go to a guy who's got a degree in counseling that's not anything from the Bible and listen to them, they're going to misguide you. They're going to mislead you. And before you know it, they'll start telling you, why don't you just leave your husband? Because you're not happy there anyway. And the whole goal of life is to be happy. So get out of it. You need to be happy. You need a break. And that's what this man called me to tell me. My wife told me she needs a break. I go, a break? What does that mean, a break? Move out of the house? Because there's an old saying in in churches, they vote it with their feet. What does that mean? They left. They left. If they left you, they left you. So Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 7 says, those who have been widowed, those who have been abandoned, those who have been divorced, those who are single. So if you're abandoned, you're abandoned. If somebody left you, you can't force them to be with you, but they have voted with their feet. That's why I don't go running after people when they tell me I'm leaving. I don't run after them because you have to make up your own mind about which church you're following, which savior you're following. Uh, I don't, I don't encourage you to follow a church. I encourage you to follow Jesus and be involved in a church. See the difference? The church isn't the answer. Jesus is the answer. So the Holy Spirit is our source of counsel and truth. If you want to have good counsel, good guidance, you need to listen to the Bible through the person of the Holy Spirit. Watch. I will ask the Father. Notice what Jesus does here. I, the Son of God, Jesus, who the Word became flesh, I will ask the Father. So Jesus doesn't call himself the Father. He says, I, the Son of God, will ask God the Father, and he will send you the Counselor, another Counselor, to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. So he distinguishes the Father and the Spirit and the Son. They're distinguished here. One God in three persons. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. One God in three persons manifested himself historically to humanity in three persons. The Father seated upon the throne of glory, the Son, the Word of God through whom all things were created, and the Spirit, the Spirit of God who is everywhere. The Spirit of God in the study of the pneumatology, which is the study of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. He is called omnipresent. What does that mean? Everywhere you go, there he is. He is in heaven. David the king said, I go to heaven, thou art there. I go to the depths, thou art there. I make my bed in Sheol, the place of the dead, thou art there. Everywhere you go, the spirit is there because God is omnipresent. So the counselor is there with you. And I've read this passage as a Christian. I became a Christian at 19, and I've been going to Bible school and seminaries and um, teaching and preaching for a long time. And just like we do when we have our Friday night Bible study, and now those of you who want to have Wednesday day potluck Bible study at noon, we're going to do that because some people don't like to go out at night. I I use those Bible studies to help me to prepare sermons, and you help me too, because people will say things in the Bible study, hey, what about this, what about that? And I go, oh, all right, text me, text me that verse, because that's a good point, because all believers have the Spirit. So look what I saw here that I didn't see before. He will be with you, how, how long? And what? guess what struck me? I'd read that word many times, but I didn't really get the concept. So I go like, wow. When I'm in eternity in heaven with God, guess who's there with me? The Holy Spirit. God will be with me even in heaven. Isn't that a neat promise? You're not going to be alone ever, forevermore, for eternity. You'll never be alone. Even if you're all alone, if you're a widow, if you're an orphan, if you're put in solitary confinement by persecutors of Christianity and they say, we're going to put this guy all alone. You're not alone because God is with you. Jesus is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. The Spirit of the truth of God. Now, the Holy Spirit indwells believers. What is indwelling? It's not a one-time experience. It's not like, I came and I got the Holy Spirit. It doesn't happen to you one time. Paul later develops this more. We'll we'll cover this maybe next week. Where the issue is you need to learn how to walk in step with the Spirit who is in you. The Holy Spirit's in you, and you need to learn how to walk in unison, in concert with the Spirit of God. 
So it's not a one-time experience, it's an forever experience. It's an experience of being sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit through the Bible and through prayer and through obedience. That's how you listen to the Holy Spirit. It's not like, come up front to the church and we'll pray over you and boom, you have the Holy Spirit and now everything's good. You still have to learn how to walk with the Holy Spirit, how to listen to the Holy Spirit, and how to not grieve the Holy Spirit who is in you, said the Apostle Paul. So Jesus again speaks here. He's teaching about the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept him. This world that you and I live in, the non-believing world of human beings cannot accept the Holy Spirit. They never have. He actually teaches them a little bit later. He tells them, don't be surprised that the world hates you. It hated me. From the beginning, the non-believing world has always belie- believed that God doesn't exist. They don't want God in their lives. They don't believe that there is God. There isn't any creator God, because if they acknowledge that, then they would have to listen to him. The world can not accept him because it cannot see him or know him. That word is knowledge. You have you have knowledge of God. They don't know him. They call themselves atheists. That means A is the Greek word no, and theos is God. They, they are atheists, no God, or they are agnostics. I don't know. I don't know who he is. I don't know who God is. I don't believe that there is a God. There's atheists and there's agnostics and then everything in between. But you, if you're a true believer, Judas is already gone, so the, the remaining disciples are true believers. You know him. Why? He will live with you, and better than that, he will live in you. He indwells you. So when David the king said in Psalms, Lord, take not thy spirit from me, that's what used to happen before Christ died. After Christ died, the Holy Spirit is allowed to come, Acts chapter 2, and indwell the believer forever. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. You'll never be left alone because the Holy Spirit is the person of God in you. It's not that you're God. God moved into you. You're not alone. The Russians, when they were persecuting Christianity in the USSR, they would take Christians and say, these guys are mentally ill because they talk to somebody that's not there. Because they didn't believe that there was a God. We can't see him when they sent the cosmonauts, that's astronauts in Russian, up to the outer space. They said, see, there's no God up here. Because they're looking for God in physical ways. You can't find him that way, even though the Bible says in Romans that God has shown himself plainly to all human beings of all time periods and from all cultures that he exists by the very fact of the beauty of creation all around them. It testifies that there is a God. So even though there is all of this wonderful revelation of God's creation and handiwork in creation, whether it's outer space or stars or mountains or trees or animals, people still say there's no God. They still say it. So we need more revelation. We need the word of God. So none other than Jesus Christ resides in you, in the person of the Holy Spirit. So what's Jesus teaching? I'm going to send you, I'm going to ask the Father, he will send to you another counselor who will indwell you. But guess what? It gets better than that. It's me. I'm coming to you in the person of the Holy Spirit. Watch. I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you as orphans. I told this to Ali. I said, you're not an orphan. You're not alone. You have us. You have God. She's not alone. You guys get this? You're not alone. There is God. And the Bible says all over the Bible from Deuteronomy, Genesis, all the way through Job, through Psalms, through Proverbs, through the prophets, in the New Testament, in James. Guess what it says? God says, the widow and the orphan. The brother of Jesus Christ said this in his little epistle, James, true religion undefiled is this, to look out for the widow and the orphan. Okay, so if you say you believe in God, you need to protect, be concerned with, pray for, minister to widows and orphans. That's why we're taking up this little cause of helping out Lena take jackets and shoes and and items down to Mexico for kids who are in an orphanage because she herself had been an orphan raised on the street, she said. An orphan is not parentless because the Bible guarantees this. God says, I will be a father to the fatherless. I will be a husband to the widow. And he actually criticized Israel through the prophets, not just one, many. He said, you oppress the widow, you oppress the orphan. Therefore, I will take up their cause. They cried out to me, and I'm going to answer for them. God has caused himself to be the one who looks out for widows and orphans. I will come to you. 
Before long, the world will not see me anymore. I'm going to die on the cross. They're going to bury me. They're going to forget about me. He's just a man in history. He's just a man in a book. But you, Jesus' disciples, and you need to include yourself there unless you're not. If you're not a disciple, then you're a Judas. Either you're with Jesus or you're not with Jesus. If you're with Jesus, then you're a disciple. That means a learner, one who's placed themselves under the tutelage or the teaching of Jesus Christ, the pastor, the, ma- the, the master teacher. You will see me because I live, you will live. Because of my resurrection, you're guaranteed eternal life. Even if you die, you will live. The apostles, they're still alive. John, Peter, Andrew, Philip, they're alive. They're alive. On that day, you will realize I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. That's First John. We're invited into this wonderful relationship that even though there's a world of atheists and agnostics who attack God and God's people, they cannot, what does it say in Romans? Nothing can separate us from God. Nothing and no one, not demons, not death, not war, not sword. Nothing can take us away from Jesus Christ. Brandy was not taken away from God and Jesus Christ. You are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them. And you say, well, was, was so-and-so obeying? Well, the obedience is simple. Do you believe? Do you believe he's the one? That's it. That's the obedience here. He who loves me. Whoever loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love him and show myself to him. So how does God show himself to you? How does Jesus show himself to you? He was limited while he was here on earth in his physical body. But now in the person of the Holy Spirit, he is not limited. He can come into me. He can come into Andrew, into Deborah, into any one of us who believe. That's the genius of Christianity. You're not alone. You don't need just a preacher behind a pulpit. You already have a preacher. He's inside of you because the person that's inside of you is the person who authored this book and that's the book he'll teach you from so the holy trinity resides in you so it gets better not only is you have your own counselor you don't have to pay him by the way Uh, it doesn't cost you 200 dollars an hour he's in you he's in you jesus comes to you in the person of the holy spirit but not only that the whole trinity father son and holy spirit resides in you in the person of the holy spirit watch he continues to teach here John 14, 22. One of the disciples said, Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not the world? We think that God should just, okay, here I am, I'm God, everybody believe in me. But that's not what we need. See, when you approach things from God, why don't you do it this way? Then you're trying to do for God what only he knows how to do. You think that you have, even the disciple right here asked, why don't you show yourself to everybody? Why don't you just do it the way we would do it? You know, if you're really the the Savior and the Messiah, it'd be easy for you. Even his brother said this in the Gospel of John. uh, No one acting in who wants to be a public figure acts in private. Why don't you show yourself to the world? If you're really the Christ, show yourself. Demonstrate. While he was on the cross, remember that's what they accused him of? If you are the Christ, then show us by getting off the cross. If you're really the Christ. But we needed him to not just be on the cross. We needed him to stay on the cross and we needed him to die on the cross and to be buried and resurrected and ascend into heaven and send us the Holy Spirit and come again to take us to himself. If anyone loves me, uh, one of the disciples asked, okay, Lord, why don't you show yourself to the whole world? And Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my teaching. You'll believe. You'll accept the way God does things. You won't fight against this. Okay, God, I don't understand it. I think I would do something different if I were you, but you're not. Remember that. In the back of your head, always remember this. I'm not God. Always remind yourself this. I'm not God. I'm not God. I can't figure this out, but he can. My father will love you. God, the father will love you. And we will come to him slash her. And we will make our home with you. So, The Holy Spirit comes to you and he indwells you. Jesus and the person of the Holy Spirit lives in you and with you. God the Father is the person of the Holy Spirit comes and makes our home with you. So this is genius. You're not dependent on a religion, a church, a preacher, a teacher, because you have the very person of God in you once you're born again. You're not alone. Somebody told me, I'm not a theologian. You are. Because you have the author of the Bible who understands every nuance of every teaching in the Bible. And they can sh- he can show you every truth. So the Holy Spirit's main ministry isn't to make you feel. 
That's not the issue. Of course you have feelings. You have grief, you have sorrow, you have happiness, you have, you have all of the feel. You have love, you have hate, you have anger. All of those feelings are, were made in the image of God. You have them. They're real. There's nothing wrong with feelings. Obviously, in feelings, when you're bereaved, you're going to feel sad. You're going to feel low and in darkness. But don't stay there because that's not the main ministry of the Holy Spirit. His main ministry is to teach you, to teach you the word of the Lord. Why? Because the information of the word of the Lord is what gives you the strength to go through. That's why it says in Corinthians, he will give you a way through everything that you go through everything that you face, whatever it is. Some of us face really difficult things like what's going on with Rose and Marcel and Ellie right now. Most of us think to ourselves, well, I hope I never go through that. You might, you might, you might go through this. Many people in Israel are going through this right now, but they don't believe in Jesus Christ. We have Jesus Christ. We have the counselor. But watch this teaching. The counselor, this is Jesus continuing, the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, whom the Father will send in my name. What will he do? He'll make you feel good. He'll make you feel close to God. Is that what the issue is? Do we need feelings or do we need information? He will teach you. He'll give you information. He'll give you guidance. He'll give you counsel. He'll show you the word of God and will remind you of what? What does he remind you of? Yesterday's news does he remind you of everything I have said to you? When, when years ago, some years ago, maybe three years ago, when all of the political fracas was going on, I was all getting embroiled in it. And I said, no, no, I got to get out of that. Because when you study Jesus Christ, he didn't get pulled to the right, to the left, paying taxes to Romans. He stayed out of all of that fracas. Why? Because there's something more important than just temporal news. There's something way more important than America or Republicans or Democrats or, or wars or Russia or Ukraine. You can't solve any of that, can you? What can you do about it? What can I do about it? Why do you spend all of your time wondering about what they're going to do next? It's because you like drama. It's an addiction to drama. What you really need is the teaching of God to be reminded of all that he taught us. Well, what did Jesus teach us? He taught us, taught us how to love, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, believe in God, serve God, follow God. That's what he taught us. He never teaches us to murder, to hate, to destroy. He teaches us good things, wonderful things, things that last forever. That's what he teaches us. Everything that Jesus taught us is here. Nowhere in the Bible is there anything that contradicts the Bible. People say, well, you don't know about the Bible. You don't know if you can trust the Bible. Yes, I do. I know I can trust the Bible. Yeah, but what about the, the gospel of Mary Magdalene or the gospel of Judas? Well, guess what? Those books were rejected out of hand. And the reason they were rejected is because they teach stuff that is really weird. Any teaching, any so-called Bible book that they supposedly left out, they didn't leave out those books. They kicked them out. They kicked those books out. The early church fathers way, way back when Christianity first started, they didn't have to worry about Genesis through Malachi. It was already set down. Jesus and the, and the leaders of Israel and the, and the rabbis, they had already set down Genesis through Malachi. That is scripture. They didn't put the Apocrypha in. Yeah, they had Maccabees. Yeah, they had those other books, but they didn't consider that to be scriptures. Jesus never quoted from those scriptures. He quoted from the prophets, the Psalms, the law. That's what he quoted from. That was already established. So then after Jesus and the church started, then the Gospels, the Epistles, the Book of Acts, Hebrews, Revelation, uh, all of that was added to what we now have in our hands called the Bible. So the Bible is the Word of God, and it doesn't contradict itself. If anyone says, well, there's a, a Gospel book over here that they didn't want to put in because those old white guys, they didn't want to include it. It wasn't old white guys that gave us the Bible. They were Jews, okay? They were probably brownish like myself. Okay, so if you got a problem with old white guys, poor white guys, you know, it's like it's a crime to be a white guy nowadays. <laughs> in this culture that we are now living in, it's awful. You know, I don't know why we do this with skin tone and color and culture. I don't understand. That's Satan. I'm sure it's Satan. He loves to divide. He loves to bring division into humanity. Oh, that guy looks different than you, so I'm glad he looks different than me. I would hate to look at myself and everybody else. 
I love the complexity and diversity of different kinds of people. The result of the Holy Spirit's ministry to you is one thing, peace. Peace. Peace that passes understanding. When people have asked me, how do you go through that? How did you go through that? It's by the promises. That's it. That's it. People can come up to you and thank God that there are people that are very, very, uh, they have a gift at being able to come alongside you when you're going through stuff and help you. My sister-in-law came down from, from Colorado to be with us when our son died, and she made meals for us. She cleaned the house, and we were just wiped out, and we were, it was just awful. And you're going through this horrible stuff. But ultimately, the peace and the promises of God are what sustained us and give us continued hope. When I find myself getting into, I feel depressed because I miss my son today. Guess what I actually do? I say, okay, God, but he is not here. He's with you. And so that's good with me. And I want to rest in your promises. I want to stay in your promises, not go into the dark hole of depression and blackness of anxiety and hopelessness. I want to stay in the promises. So look what he says next. Peace I leave with you. In Aramaic, the language spoken of by Jesus and the apostles at the time of his uh, dwelling here on earth was Aramaic, which was like a, a modern day Hebrew. Peace, that's that word, shalom. Shalom I give to you. My shalom I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. The world cannot give you this kind of peace. You won't find it in worldly philosophies, religion, politics. Don't let your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. You don't have to be afraid as a believer. No matter what happens to you, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to. I don't think Brandy was ever afraid. I didn't ever pick that up from her. She seemed to have a total confidence. Her her husband, Adam, told me that when he was kind of really worried, she goes, no, no, don't worry about it. He's just talking a bunch of nonsense. Yes, yes, maybe he went over the edge, this guy whoever it is that that is responsible for this. He went over the edge. He's definitely got blood on his hands. He is a murderer. And a murderer will be judged. The Bible actually says that one who has blood on their hands, they've they've stained their own soul. They're responsible now before God himself. Ask Cain when God told him, I will put a mark on you. You're marked now. You're marked. You're a murderer. You have blood on your hands. You have innocent blood on your hands. Because when God asks Cain, where is your brother? I don't know where he is. Am I his keeper? Here's the murderer. He goes, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. So God knows. God knows who did it. And God knows what will happen if that guy doesn't repent. He's got to repent. He's in way more danger than Brandy ever was. He's in mortal, eternal danger. So the result is peace. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus' will in word in your personal life. What is the will of Jesus and what is the word of Jesus to you personally? Well, it's this. I have much more to say to you. That is the cry of every pastor. I could preach and preach and preach about this, but Jesus even acknowledges this. There's so much information that God would give you, more than you can now bear. But when he comes, when I accomplish the death on the cross and the payment for sin and the burial and the resurrection, the ascension to heaven, and the spirit of truth comes and indwells you, he will guide you into all truth, all truth. And you won't find it in social media. Now, there are Christians on social media who will tell you about the Trinity, who will tell you about. I was listening to a guy who was actually trying to help people to who were denying the Trinity. And it was really, really good. If you want uh, questions answered, you can ask us. We'll give you books. We'll give you information about how you can have these questions answered. But ultimately, the spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. That's the genius of Christianity. You're not dependent on Jimmy Sandoval or on John MacArthur or on whoever your favorite preacher is. He will not speak on his own. So the Holy Spirit doesn't magnify himself. He speaks only what he hears and will tell you what is yet to come. Well, how come I didn't know that this was going to happen? No, it doesn't mean they give you every nuance of every detail that's going to come. He's going to tell you about the ultimate end result of what God's going to do. He will bring glory, I'm sorry, He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine, that is what I have taught, and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father, everything that He taught since Genesis is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine, my teaching, and make it known to you. The Holy Spirit is there to give you the right information, and here it is. Here it is. That's the issue. So let's stand and let's read this together. This kind of sums it all up. This is in Philippians. Now, when I first went to church after the death of my son, 
I wasn't in a mood to rejoice. I didn't feel happiness. I didn't even feel like singing. But I do know this, that he does give back to you the praise and the rejoicing. Watch. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Isn't that a cool promise? How did God take you through stuff? That's how. It doesn't mean that everything that you go through is pleasant. It's not. But there is an underlying peace that even in the face of tragedy and death, or in this case, this Sunday, murder, God can give peace and you can have that peace. So let's ask him for that now. We do pray that the peace of God would permeate the hearts of all of us, especially Rose and Marcel and Allie, and that they would have total peace and trust in your ability to oversee everything that's coming in the future. We ask in Jesus' name that you'll give us all that ability, Lord. Help us to submit ourselves to the oversight of the Holy Spirit who is inside of us. And as Paul teaches, we must learn how to keep in step and walk with His Spirit. And that's a daily task. We're not going to have a one-time experience with the Holy Spirit. We're going to have an experience with you for the rest of eternity. We need to be worked with by the Holy Spirit. We need to learn obedience and trust and, and belief and faith. And we need to overcome our anger problem, our hate problem, our mad problem. We need to uh, overcome all of these issues that we face so that the Spirit of God may find a willing disciple in us. Help your people, Lord, to be filled today with your Holy Spirit and to feel the presence of God in the Spirit not in their physical bodies, but in the spirit, which is something that the world cannot see and cannot know because they do not have the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the person of God, the person of Jesus inside of them. We do. Amen.